and in that I learn of him, Ralph Waldo Emerson. The legend of Genghis Khan has echoed through history, a barbarian conqueror fueled by bloodlust, terrorizing the civilized world. We have him and his Mongol horde traveling across Asia and Europe, insatiable, stopping at nothing to plunder, rape, and kill not just the people who stood in their way, but the cultures they had built. Then, not unlike his nomadic band of warriors, this terrible cloud simply disappeared from history because the Mongols built nothing that could last. Like all reactionary emotional assessments, this could not be more wrong. For not only was Genghis Khan one of the greatest military minds who ever lived, he was a perpetual student, whose stunning victories were often the result of his ability to absorb the best technologies, practices, and innovations from each new culture his empire touched. In fact, if there is one theme in his reign, and in the several centuries of dynastic rule that followed, it's this, appropriation. Under Genghis Khan's direction, the Mongols were as ruthless about stealing and absorbing the best of each culture they encountered as they were about the conquest itself. Though there were essentially no technological inventions, no beautiful buildings, or even great Mongol art, with each battle an enemy, their culture learned and absorbed something new. Genghis Khan was not born a genius, instead, as one biographer put it, his was a persistent cycle of pragmatic learning experimental adaptation, and constant revision driven by his uniquely disciplined and focused will. He was the greatest conqueror the world ever knew because he was more open to learning than any other conqueror has ever been. Khan's first powerful victories came from the reorganization of his military units, splitting his soldiers into groups of 10. This he stole from the neighboring Turkic tribes and unknowingly converted the Mongols to the decimal system. Soon enough, their expanding empire brought them into contact with another technology that they'd never experienced before, walled cities. In the Tangut raids, Khan first learned the ins and outs of war against fortified cities and the strategies critical to laying siege and quickly became an expert. Later, with help from Chinese engineers, he taught his soldiers how to build siege machines that could knock down city walls. In his campaigns against the Jerkid, Khan learned the importance of winning the hearts and minds. By working with the scholars and royal family of the lands he conquered, Khan was able to hold on and manage these territories in ways that most empires could not. Afterwards, in every country or city he held, Khan would call for the smartest astrologers, scribes, doctors, thinkers and advisors, anyone who could aid his troops and their efforts. His troops traveled with interrogators and translators for precisely this purpose. It was a habit that would survive his death. While the Mongols seemed dedicated almost solely to the art of war, they put to good use every craftsman, merchant, scholar, entertainer, cook, and skilled worker they came in contact with. The Mongol Empire was remarkable for its religious freedoms, and most of all for its love of ideas and convergence of cultures. It brought lemons to China for the first time, and Chinese noodles to the West. It spread Persian carpets, German mining technology, French metalworking, and Islam. The cannon, which revolutionized warfare, was said to be the resulting fusion of Chinese gunpowder, Muslim flamethrowers, and European metalwork. It was Mongol openness to learning and new ideas that brought them together. As we first succeed, we will find ourselves in new situations facing new problems. The freshly promoted soldier must learn the art of politics, the salesman how to manage, the founder how to delegate, the writer how to edit others, the comedian how to act, the chef turned restaurateur how to run the other side of the house. This is not a harmless conceit. The physicist John Wheeler, who helped develop the hydrogen bomb, once observed that as our island of knowledge grows, so does the shore of our ignorance. In other words, each victory and advancement that made Khan smarter also bumped him against new situations he'd never encountered before. It takes a special kind of humility to grasp that you know less, even as you know and grasp more and more. It's worth remembering Socrates' wisdom lay in the fact that he knew that he knew next to nothing. With accomplishment comes a growing pressure to pretend that we know more than we do, to pretend we already know everything. Knowledge, 
puffs up. That's the worry and the risk, thinking that we're set and secure, when in reality, understanding and mastery is a fluid, continual process. The nine-time Grammy and Pulitzer Prize winning jazz musician Wynton Marsalis once advised a promising young musician on the mindset required in a lifelong study of music. He said, Humility engenders learning because it beats back the arrogance that puts blinders on. It leaves you open for truths to reveal themselves. You don't stand in your own way. Do you know how you can tell when someone is truly humble? I believe there's one simple test. Because they consistently observe and listen, the humble improve, they don't assume I know the way. No matter what you've done up to this point, you better still be a student. If you're not still learning, you're already dying. It's not enough only to be a student at the beginning. It's a position that one has to assume for life. Learn from everyone and everything. From the people you beat, from the people who beat you, from the people who you dislike, even from your supposed enemies. At every step and every juncture in life, there is the opportunity to learn. And even if the lesson is purely remedial, we must not let ego block us from hearing it again. Too often, convinced of our own intelligence, we stay in a comfort zone that ensures that we will never feel stupid and are never challenged to learn or reconsider what we know. It obscures from view various weaknesses in our understanding until eventually it's too late to change course. This is where the silent toll is taken. Each of us faces a threat as we pursue our craft. Like sirens on the rocks, ego sings a soothing, validating song, which can lead to a wreck. The second we let the ego tell us we've graduated, learning grinds to a halt. That's why Frank Shamrock said always stay a student, as in it never ends. The solution is as straightforward as it is initially uncomfortable. Pick up a book on a topic you know next to nothing about. Put yourself in rooms where you're the least knowledgeable person. That uncomfortable feeling, that defensiveness you feel when your most deeply held assumptions are challenged. What about subjecting yourself to it deliberately? Change your mind, change your surroundings. An amateur is defensive. The professional finds learning and even occasionally being shown up to be enjoyable. They like being challenged and humble and engage in education as an ongoing and endless process. Most military cultures, people in general, seek to impose values and control over what they encounter. What made the Mongols different was their ability to weigh each situation objectively, and if need be, swap out a previous practice for a new one. All great businesses start this way, and then something happens. Take the theory of disruption, which posits that at some point in time, Every industry will be disrupted by some trend or innovation that despite all the resources in the world, the incumbent interests will be incapable of responding to. Foc see focus. Do it if you're going to do it. There's another apt Latin expression. Mat riem superbat opus. The workmanship was better than the material. The material we've been given genetically, emotionally, and financially, that's where we begin. We don't control that. We do control what we make of that material and whether we squander it. As a young basketball player, Bill Bradley would remind himself, when you are not practicing, remember someone somewhere is practicing and when you meet him, he will win. The Bible says something similar in its own way. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. You can lie to yourself, saying that you put in the time or pretend that you're working but eventually someone will show up. You will be tested and quite possibly found out. Since Bradley went on to be an All-American, a Rhodes Scholar, and a two-time champion with the New York Knicks and a US Senator, you get the sense that this sort of dedication will take you places. So we must have it because there is no triumph without toil. Wouldn't it be great if work was as simple as opening a vein and letting the genius pour out? Or if you could walk into that meeting and spit brilliance off the top of your head, you could walk up to the canvas, hurl your paint at it, and modern art emerges, right? That's the fantasy. Rather, that is the lie. Back to another popular old trope, fake it till you make it. It's no surprise that such an idea has found increasing relevance in our noxiously bullshit nerf world. 
When it is difficult to tell a real producer from an adept self-promoter, of course, some people will roll the dice and manage to play the confidence game. Make it so you don't have to fake it. That's the key. Can you imagine a doctor trying to get by with anything less? Or a quarterback? Or a bull rider? More to the point, would you want them to? So why would you try it otherwise? Every time you sit down to work, remind yourself, I am delaying gratification by doing this. I am passing the marshmallow test. I am earning what my ambition burns for. I am making an investment in myself instead of in my ego. Give yourself a little credit for this choice, but not so much because you've got to get back to the task at hand. Practicing, working, improving. Work is finding yourself alone at the track when the weather kept everyone else indoors. Work is pushing through the pain in the crappy first drafts and prototypes. It is ignoring whatever plaudits others are getting, and more importantly, ignoring whatever plaudits you may be getting. Because there is work to be done. Work doesn't want to be good. It is made so, despite the headwind. There is another old expression, you know a workman by the chips they leave. It's true. To judge your progress properly, just take a look at the floor. For everything that comes next, ego is the enemy. Tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder. Shakespeare. We know where we want to end up. Success. We want to matter. Wealth and recognition and reputation are nice too. We want it all. The problem is we're not sure that humility can get us there. We are petrified, as the Reverend Dr. Sam Wells put it, that if we are humble, we will end up subjugated, trodden on, embarrassed, and irrelevant. Midway through his career, if you'd asked our model Sherman how he felt, he probably would have described himself in almost exactly those terms. He had not made much money. He had won no great battles. He had not seen his name in lights or headlines. He might have, at that moment, before the Civil War, begun to question the path he'd chosen, and whether those who follow it finished last. This is the kind of thinking that creates the Faustian bargain that turns most clean ambition into shameless addiction. In the early stages, ego can be temporarily adaptive. Craziness can pass for audaciousness. Delusions can pass for confidence. Ignorance for courage. But it's just kicking the cost down the road. Because no one ever said, reflecting on the whole of someone's life, man, that monstrous ego sure was worth it. The internal debate about confidence calls to mind a well-known concept from the radio pioneer Ira Glass, which could be called the taste talent gap. He said, quote, all of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good taste. But it's like there's a gap that for the first couple years you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good. It's really not that great. It's trying to be good. It has ambition to be good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, your taste is still killer, and your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. It is in precisely this gap that ego can seem comforting. Who wants to look at themselves and their work and find that it does not measure up? And so here we might bluster our way through, cover up hard truths with sheer force of personality and drive and passion. Or we can face our shortcomings honestly and put the time in. We can let this humble us, see clearly where we are talented and where we need to improve, and then put in the work to bridge that gap. And we can set upon positive habits that will last a lifetime. If ego was tempting in Sherman's time, in this era, we are like Lance Armstrong training for the 1999 Tour de France. We are Barry Bonds debating whether to walk into the Balco Clinic. We flirt with arrogance and deceit, and in the process grossly overstate the importance of winning at all cost. Everyone is juicing, the ego says to us. You should too. There's no way to beat them without it, we think. Of course, what is truly ambitious is to face life and proceed with quiet confidence in spite of the distractions. Let others grasp at crutches. It will be a lonely fight to be real, to say, 
I'm not going to take the edge off to say, I'm going to be myself, the best version of that self. I am in this for the long game, no matter how brutal it might be, to do, not be. For Sherman, it was precisely his choice that prepared him for the time his country and history most needed him, and allowed him to navigate the massive responsibilities that shortly came his way. In this quiet crucible, he'd forged a personality that was ambitious but patient, innovative without being brash, brave without being dangerous. He was a real leader. You have a chance to do this yourself, to play a different game, to be utterly audacious in your aims, because what comes next is going to test you in ways that you cannot begin to understand. For ego is a wicked sister of success, and you're about to experience what that means. Part 2. Success Here we are at the top of the mountain we worked hard to climb, or at least the summit is in sight. We now face new temptations and problems. We breathe thinner air in an unforgiving environment. Why is success so ephemeral? Ego shortens it. Whether a collapse is dramatic or a slow erosion, it's always possible and often unnecessary. We stop learning. We stop listening. We lose our grasp on what matters. We become victims of ourselves in the competition. Sobriety, open-mindedness, organization, and purpose, these are the great stabilizers. They balance out the ego and pride that comes with achievement and recognition. To whatever success you have achieved, ego is the enemy. Two different characters are presented to our emulation. The one of proud ambition and ostentatious avidity. The other of humble modesty and equitable justice. Two different models, two different pictures are held out to us according to which we may fashion our own character and behavior. The one more gaudy and glittering in its coloring, the other more correct and more exquisitely beautiful in its outline. Adam Smith At a business meeting in January 1924, Howard Hughes Sr., a successful inventor and tool magnate, stood up, convulsed, and died from a sudden heart attack at the age of 54. His son, a quiet, reserved, and sheltered boy of just 18, inherited three-fourths of the private company, which held patents and leases critical to oil drilling worth nearly $1 million. Various family members were bequeathed the remaining shares. In a move of almost incomprehensible foresight, the young Hughes, who many saw as a spoiled little boy, made the decision to buy out his relatives and control the entire company himself. Against their objections, and still legally considered a minor, Hughes leveraged his personal assets and nearly all the company's funds to purchase the stock, and in doing so consolidated ownership of a business that would create billions of dollars of cash profit over the next century. It was a bold move for a young man with essentially zero experience in business, and it was with similar boldness that over his career he would create one of the most embarrassing, wasteful, and dishonest business track records in history. In retrospect, his years at the helm of the Hughes Empire resemble a deranged crime spree more than a capitalistic enterprise. One cannot argue whether Hughes was gifted, visionary, or brilliant. He just was. Literally a mechanical genius, he was also one of the best and bravest pilots in the pioneer days of aviation. And as a businessman and a filmmaker, he had the ability to predict wide, sweeping changes that came to transform not just the industries he was involved in, but in America itself. Yet after filtering out his acumen from the legend, glamour, and self-promotion at which he was so adept, only one image remains. An egomaniac who evaporated hundreds of millions of dollars of his own wealth and met a miserable, pathetic end. Not by accident, not because he was beset by unforeseen circumstances or competition, but almost exclusively due to his own actions. A quick rundown of his feats, if you can call them that, provides a stark perspective. After purchasing control of his father's tool company from his family, Hughes abandoned it almost immediately except to repeatedly siphon off its cash. He left Houston and never stepped foot in the company's headquarters again. 
He moved to Los Angeles, where he decided to become a film producer and celebrity. Trading stocks from his bedside, he lost more than $8 million in the market leading up to the Depression. His most well-known movie, Hell's Angels, took three years to make, lost $1.5 million on a budget of $4.2 million, and nearly bankrupted the tool company in the process. How much better could these writers have been had they managed to get through these troubles earlier? How much easier would their lives have been? It's an urgent question they pushed onto their readers with their cautionary characters. Because sadly, this trait, the inability to get out of one's head, is not restricted to fiction. 2400 years ago, Plato spoke of the type of people who are guilty of feasting on their own thoughts. It was apparently common enough even then to find people who, instead of finding out how something they desire might actually come about, they pass that over so as to avoid tiring deliberations about what's possible. They assume that what they desire is available and proceed to arrange the rest, taking pleasure in thinking through everything they'll do when they have what they want, thereby making their lazy souls even lazier. Feel people preferring to live in passionate fiction than in actual reality. The Civil War General George McClellan is the perfect example of this archetype. He was chosen to command the Union forces because he checked all of the boxes of what a great general should be. West Point grad, proven in battle, a student of history, of regal bearing, loved by his men. Why did he turn out to be quite possibly the worst Union general, even in a crowded field of incompetent and self-absorbed leaders? Because he could never get out of his own head. He was in love with his vision of himself as the head of a grand army. He could prepare an army for battle like a professional. But when it came to lead one into battle, when rubber needed to meet the road, troubles arose. He became laughably convinced that the enemy was growing larger and larger. It wasn't. At one point, he actually had a three times advantage. But he was convinced of constant threats and intrigues from his political allies. There weren't any. He was convinced that the only way to win the war was with the perfect plan and a single decisive campaign. He was wrong. He was so convinced of all of it that he froze and basically did nothing for months at a time. McClellan was constantly thinking about himself and how wonderful he was doing, congratulating himself for victories not yet won, and more often for horrible defeats he had saved the cause from. When anyone, including his superiors, questioned this comforting fiction, he reacted like a petulant, delusional, vainglorious, and selfish ass. By itself, that's insufferable, but it meant another thing. His personality made it almost impossible to do what he needed to do most, win battles. A historian who fought under McClellan at Antietam later summed it up. His egotism is simply colossal. There is no other word for it. We tend to think that ego equals confidence, which is what we need to be in charge. In fact, it can have the opposite effect. In McClellan's case, it deprived him of the ability to lead. It robbed him of the ability to think that he even needed to act. And repeated opportunities he missed would have been laughable were it not for the thousands and thousands of lives they cost. The situation was made worse by the fact that two pious, quiet Southerners, Lee and Stonewall Jackson, with a penchant for taking the initiative, were able to embarrass him with inferior numbers and inferior resources, which is what happens when leaders get stuck in their own head. It can happen to us too. The novelist Anne Lamott describes that eco story well. If you're not careful, she warns young writers, station KFKD, K fucked, will play in your head 24 hours a day, non stop in stereo. As she put it, out of the right speaker in your inner ear will come an endless stream of self-aggrandizement, the recitation of one's specialness, of how much more open and gifted and brilliant and knowing and misunderstood and humble one is. Out of the left speaker will be the rap songs of self-loathing, the lists of all the things one doesn't do well, of all the mistakes one has made today and over an entire lifetime, the doubt, the assertion that everything one touches turns to shit, that one doesn't do relationships well, that one is in every way a fraud, incapable of selfless love, that one had no talent or insight, and on and on and on. 
Anyone, particularly the ambitious, can fall prey to this narration, good and bad. It is natural for any young, ambitious person, or simply someone whose ambition is young, to get excited and swept up by their thoughts and feelings, especially in a world that tells us to keep and promote a personal brand. We're required to tell stories in order to sell our work and our talents, and after enough time, we forget where the line is that separates our fictions from reality. Ultimately, this disability will paralyze us, or it will become a wall between us and the information we need to do our jobs, which is largely why McClellan continually fell for flawed intelligence reports he ought to have known were wrong. The idea that his task was relatively straightforward, that he just needed to get started, was almost too easy and too obvious to someone who had thought so much about it all. He's not that different from the rest of us. We are all full of anxieties, doubts, impotence, pain, and sometimes a little tinge of crazy. We're like teenagers in this regard. As the psychologist David Elkind has famously researched, Adolescence is marked by a phenomenon known as the imaginary audience. Consider a 13-year-old so embarrassed that he misses a week of class, positive that the entire school is thinking and murmuring about some tiny incident that in truth hardly anyone noticed. Or a teenage girl who spends three hours in front of the mirror each morning, as if she's about to go on stage. They do this because they are convinced that their every move is being watched with rapt attention by the rest of the world. Even as adults, we're susceptible to this fantasy during a harmless walk down the street. We plug in some headphones and all of a sudden there's a soundtrack. We flip up our jacket collar and consider briefly how cool we must look. We replay that successful meeting that we're heading toward in our head. The crowds part as we pass. We're fearless warriors on our way to the top. It's the opening credits montage. It's a scene in a novel. It feels good so much better than those feelings of doubt and fear and normalness. Then, not having learned a lesson the first time, Hughes lost another $4 million on Chrysler stock in the early 1930s. He then put all this aside to enter the aviation business, creating a defense contractor called the Hughes Aircraft Company. Despite some astounding personal achievements as an inventor, Hughes's company was a total failure. His two contracts during World War II worth over $40 million, were massive failures at the expense of the American taxpayer and himself. The most notable, the Spruce Goose, which Hughes called the Hercules, and which was one of the biggest planes ever made, took more than five years to develop, cost roughly $20 million, and flew just a single time for barely a mile, only 70 feet above the water. At his insistence and expense, it then sat in an air-conditioned hangar in Long Beach for decades at the cost of $1 million a year. Deciding to double down on the film business, Hughes purchased the movie studio RKO and produced losses of over $22 million and went from 2,000 employees to fewer than 500 as he ran it into the ground over the next several years. Tiring of these businesses as he had of the tool company, he forsook defense contracting and handed it off to executives to run, where it slowly began to thrive, because of his absence. It would make sense to stop here to avoid belaboring the issue, but that would risk skipping Hughes's egregious tax fraud, the plane crashes and fatal car accidents, the millions he wasted on private investigators, lawyers, contracts for starlets he refused to let act, property he never lived in, the fact that the only thing that ever got him to behave responsibly was the threat of public exposure, the paranoia, racism and bullying, the failed marriages, the drug addiction, and dozens of other ventures and businesses that he mismanaged. That we have made a hero out of Howard Hughes, a young Joan Didion wrote, tells us something interesting about ourselves. She's absolutely right. For Howard Hughes, despite his reputation, was quite possibly one of the worst businessmen of the 20th century. Usually a bad businessman fails and ceases to be in business anymore, making it hard to see what truly caused his failures. But thanks to the steady chain of profits from his father's company, which he found too boring to interfere with, Hughes was able to stay afloat, allowing us to see the damage that his ego repeatedly wrought to himself as a person, to the people around him, to what he wanted to accomplish. 
There's a scene from Howard's slow descent into madness that bears illustrating. His biographers have him sitting naked in his favorite white chair, unwashed, unkempt, working around the clock to battle lawyers, investigations, investors, in an attempt to save his empire and hide his shameful secrets. One minute he would dictate some irrational, multi-page memo about Kleenex, food preparation, or how employees should not speak to him directly, and then he would turn around and seize upon a genuinely brilliant strategy to outrun his creditors and enemies. It was as if, they observed, his mind and his business were split in two parts. It was as if, they wrote, IBM had deliberately established a pair of subsidiaries, one to produce computers and profits, the other to manufacture Edsel's and losses. If someone was looking for a flesh and blood metaphor for ego and destruction, it would be hard to do better than this image of a man working furiously with one hand toward a goal and with the other working equally hard to undermine it. Howard Hughes, like all of us, was not completely crazy or completely sane. His ego, fueled and exacerbated by physical injuries, mostly from plane and car crashes for which he was at fault, and various addictions, led him into a darkness that we can scarcely comprehend. There were brief moments of lucidity when the sharp mind of Hughes broke through, times when he made some of his best moves, but as he progressed through life these moments became increasingly rare. Eventually, ego killed Howard Hughes as much as the mania and trauma did, if they were ever separate to begin with. You can only see this if you want to see it. It's more attractive and exciting to see the rebel billionaire, the eccentric, the world renowned and the fame, and think, oh, how I want that. You do not. Howard Hughes, like so many wealthy people, died in an asylum of his own making. He felt little joy. He enjoyed almost nothing of what he had. Most importantly, he wasted. He wasted so much talent, so much bravery, and so much energy. Without virtue and training, Aristotle observed, it is hard to bear the results of good fortune suitably. We can learn from Hughes because he was so publicly and visibly unable to bear his birthright properly. His endless taste for the spotlight, no matter how unflattering, gives us an opportunity to see our own tendencies, our own struggles with success and luck, refracted back through his tumultuous life. His enormous ego and its destructive path through Hollywood, through the defense industry, through Wall Street, through the aviation industry, gives us a look inside someone who was repeatedly failed by the impulses we all have. Of course, he's far from the only person in history to follow such an arc. Will you follow his trajectory? Sometimes ego is suppressed on the ascent. Sometimes an idea is so powerful or timing is so perfect or one is born into wealth or power that it can temporarily support or even compensate for a massive ego. As success arrives like it does for a team that has just won a championship, ego begins to toy with our minds and weaken the will that made us win in the first place. We know that empires always fall, so we must think about why and why they always seem to collapse from within. Harold Jeanin was the CEO who more or less invented the concept of the modern international conglomerate. Through a series of acquisitions, mergers, and takeovers, more than 350 in all, he took a small company called ITT from $1 million in revenue in 1959 to nearly $17 billion in 1977, the year he retired. Some claimed that Jeanin himself was an egotist. In any case, he spoke candidly about the effects that ego had in his industry and warned executives against it. The worst disease which can afflict business executives in their work is not, as popularly supposed, alcoholism. It's egotism, Jeanin famously said. In the Mad Men era of corporate America, there was a major drinking problem. But ego has the same roots. Insecurity, fear, a dislike for brutal objectivity. As he said, whether in middle management or top management, unbridled personal egotism blinds a man to the realities around him. More and more he comes to live in a world of his own imagination, and because he sincerely believes he can do no wrong, he becomes a menace to the men and women who have to work under his direction. Here we have accomplished something. After we give ourselves proper credit, ego wants us to think, I'm special, I'm better, the rules don't apply to me. Man is pushed by drives, Viktor Frankl observed, 
but he is pulled by values. Ruled by or ruling, which are you? Without the right values, success is brief. If we wish to do more than flash, if we wish to last, then it is time to understand how to battle this new form of ego and what values and principles are required in order to beat it. Success is intoxicating, yet to sustain it requires sobriety. We cannot keep learning if we think we already know everything. We cannot buy into myths we make ourselves or the noise or chatter of the outside world. We must understand that we are a small part of an interconnected universe. On top of all this, we have to build an organization and a system around what we do, one that is about the work and not about us. The verdict on Hughes is in. Ego wrecked him. A similar judgment awaits us all at some point. Over the course of your own career, you will face the choices that he did, that all people do. Whether you built your empire from nothing or inherited it, whether your wealth is financial or merely a cultivated talent, entropy is seeking to destroy it as you listen to this. Can you handle success or will it be the worst thing that ever happened to you? It creates a sort of myopic, onanistic obsession that warps perspective, reality, truth, and the world around us. The childlike little prince in Saint Exupery's famous story makes the same observation, lamenting that vain men never hear anything but praise. That's exactly why we can't afford to have it as our translator. Receiving feedback, maintaining hunger, and charting a proper course in life. Pride dulls these senses, or in other cases it tunes up other negative parts of ourselves, sensitivity, a persecution complex, the ability to make everything about us. As the famous conqueror and warrior Genghis Khan groomed his sons and generals to succeed him later in life, he repeatedly warned them, if you can't swallow your pride, you can't lead. He told them that pride would be harder to subdue than a wild lion. He liked the analogy of a mountain. He would say even the tallest mountains have animals that, when they stand on it, are higher than the mountain. We tend to be on guard against negativity, against the people who are discouraging us from pursuing our callings or doubting the visions we have for ourselves. This is certainly an obstacle to be aware of, though dealing with it is rather simple. What we cultivate less is how to protect ourselves against the validation and gratification that will quickly come our way if we show promise. What we don't protect ourselves against are people and things that make us feel good, or rather, too good. We must prepare for pride and kill it early, or it will kill what we aspire to. We must be on guard against that wild self-confidence and self-obsession. As Flannery O'Connor once said, the first product of self-knowledge is humility. This is how we fight the ego, by really knowing ourselves. The question to ask when you feel pride is this. What am I missing right now that a more humble person might see? What am I avoiding or running from with my bluster, franticness, or embellishments? It is far better to ask and answer these questions now, with the stakes still low, than it will be later. It's worth saying, just because you are quiet doesn't mean that you are without pride. Privately thinking that you are better than others is still pride, and it's still dangerous. That on which you so pride yourself will be your ruin, Montaigne had inscribed on the beam of his ceiling. It's a quote from the playwright Menander, and it ends with, you who think yourself to be someone. We are still striving, and it is the strivers who should be our peers, not the proud and accomplished. Without this understanding, pride takes our self-conception and puts it at odds with the reality of our station, which is that we still have so far to go and that there is still so much to be done. After hitting his head and hearing from Mather, Franklin spent a lifetime battling against his pride because he wanted to do much and understood that pride would make it harder, which is why despite what would be dizzying accomplishments in any era, wealth, fame, power, Franklin never had to experience most of what he called misfortunes brought upon by people by carrying their heads too high. At the end, it isn't about deferring your pride because you don't deserve it yet. It isn't, don't boast about what hasn't happened yet. It's more directly, don't boast. There's nothing in it for you. Work 
work, work. The best plan is only good intentions unless it degenerates into work. Peter Drucker The painter Edward Degas, though best known for his beautiful impressionistic paintings of dancers, toyed briefly with poetry. As a brilliant and creative mind, the potential for great poems was all there. He could see beauty, he could find inspiration. Yet there are no great Degas poems. There is one famous conversation that might explain why. The poet Stefan Mallarmé, about his trouble writing. I can't manage to say what I want, and yet I'm full of ideas, he said. Mallarmé's response cuts to the bone. It's not with ideas, my dear Degas, that one makes verse. It's with words, or rather, with work. The distinction between a professional and a dilettante occurs right there. When you accept that having an idea is not enough, that you must work until you are able to recreate your experience effectively in words on the page. As the philosopher and writer Paul Valery explained in 1938, a poet's function is not to experience the poetic state. That is a private affair. His function is to create it in others. That is, his job is to produce work. To be both a craftsman and an artist, to cultivate a product of labor and industry instead of just a product of the mind. It is here where abstraction meets the road and the real, where we trade thinking and talking for working. You can't build a reputation on what you're going to do, was how Henry Ford put it. The sculptor Nina Holton hit the same note in a landmark study on creativity. That germ of an idea, she said, does not make a sculpture which stands up. It just sits there. So the next stage, of course, is the hard work. The investor and serial entrepreneur Ben Horowitz put it more bluntly. He said, the hard thing isn't setting a big, hairy, audacious goal. The hard thing is laying people off when you miss the big goal. The hard thing isn't dreaming big. The hard thing is waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat when the dream turns into a nightmare. Sure, you get it. You know that all things require work and that that work might be quite difficult. But do you really understand? Do you have any idea just how much work there is going to be? Not work until you get your big break, not work until you make a name for yourself, but work, 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 forever and ever. Is it 10,000 hours or 20,000 hours to mastery? The answer is that it doesn't matter. There is no end zone. To think of a number is to live in a conditional future. We're simply talking about a lot of hours. That to get where we want to go isn't about brilliance, but continual effort. While that's not a terribly sexy idea, it should be an encouraging one. Because it means that it's all within reach, for all of us, provided that we have the constitution and the humbleness to be patient and the fortitude to put in the work. By this point, you probably understand why the ego would bristle at this idea. Within reach, it complains, that means you're saying I don't have it now. Exactly right. You don't. No one does. Our ego wants the ideas and the fact that we aspire to do something about them to be enough. Wants the hours we spend planning and attending conferences or chatting with impressed friends to count towards the tally that success seems to require. It wants to be paid well for its time. It wants to do the fun stuff, the stuff that gets attention, credit, or glory. That's the reality, where we decide to put our energy decides what we'll ultimately accomplish. As a young man, Bill Clinton began a collection of note cards upon which he would write names and phone numbers of friends and acquaintances who might be of service when he eventually entered politics. Each night, before he ever had a reason to, he would flip through the box, make phone calls, write letters, or add notations about their interactions. Over the years, this collection grew to 10,000 cards before it was eventually digitized. It's what put him in the Oval Office and continues to return dividends. Or think of Darwin, working for decades on his theory of evolution, refraining from publishing it because it wasn't yet perfect. Hardly anyone knew what he was working on. No one said, hey Charles, it's okay that you're taking so long because what you're working on is just so important. They didn't know, he couldn't have known. He just knew that it wasn't done yet and that it could be better and that that was enough to keep him going. 
So, do we sit down alone and struggle with our work? Work that may or may not go anywhere? That may be discouraging or painful? Do we love work? Making a living to do work, not the other way around? Do we love practice the way great athletes do? Or do we chase short-term attention and validation, whether that's indulging in the endless search for ideas or simply the distraction of talk and chatter? And so we stay stuck inside our own heads instead of participating in the world around us. That's ego, baby. What successful people do is curb such flights of fancy. They ignore the temptations that might make them feel important or skew their perspective. General George C. Marshall, essentially the opposite of McClellan, even though they briefly held the same position a few generations apart, refused to keep a diary during World War II despite the requests of historians and friends. He worried that it would turn his quiet, reflective time into a sort of performance and self-deception, that he might second-guess difficult decisions out of concern for his reputation and future readers, and warp his thinking based on how they would look. All of us are susceptible to these obsessions of the mind, whether we run a technology startup or we are working our way up the ranks of the corporate hierarchy or have fallen madly in love. The more creative we are, the easier it is to lose the thread that guides us. Our imagination, in many senses an asset, is dangerous when it runs wild. We have to rein our perceptions in. Otherwise, lost in the excitement, how can we accurately predict the future or interpret events? How can we stay hungry and aware? How can we appreciate the present moment? How can we be creative within the realm of practicality? Living clearly and presently takes courage. Don't live in the haze of the abstract, Live with the tangible and real, even if, especially if, it's uncomfortable. Be part of what's going on around you. Feast on it. Adjust for it. There's no one to perform for. There's just work to be done and lessons to be learned in all that is around us. The Danger of Early Pride a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. C.S. Lewis At 18, a rather triumphant Benjamin Franklin returned to visit Boston, the city he'd run away from seven months before. Full of pride and self-satisfaction, he had a new suit, a watch, and a pocket full of coins that he spread out and showed to everyone he ran into, including his older brother, whom he particularly hoped to impress. All posturing by a boy who was not much more than an employee in a print shop in Philadelphia. In meeting with Cotton Mather, one of the town's most respected figures and a former adversary, Franklin quickly illustrated just how ridiculously inflated his young ego had become. Chatting with Mather as they walked down a hallway, Mather suddenly admonished him, Stoop! Stoop! Too caught up in his performance, Franklin walked right into a low ceiling beam. Mather's response was perfect. Let this be a caution to you not always to hold your head so high, he said wryly. Stoop, young man, stoop, as you go through this world, and you will miss many hard thumps. Christians believe that pride is a sin because it is a lie. It convinces people that they are better than they are, that they are better than God made them. Pride leads to arrogance and then away from humility and connection with their fellow man. You don't have to be Christian to see the wisdom in this. You need only to care about your career to understand that pride, even in real accomplishments, is a distraction and a deluder. Whom the gods wish to destroy, Cyril Connolly famously said, they first call promising. 2,500 years before that, the poet Theognis wrote his friend, The first thing, Kurnos, which gods bestow on one they would annihilate, is pride. Yet we pick up this mantle on purpose. Pride blunts the very instrument we need to own in order to succeed. Our mind. Our ability to learn, to adapt, to be flexible, to build relationships. All of this is dulled by pride. Most dangerously, this tends to happen either early in life or in the process, when we're flushed with beginner's conceit. 
Only later do you realize that a bump on the head was the least of what was risked. Pride takes a minor accomplishment and makes it feel like a major one. It smiles at our cleverness and genius, as though what we've exhibited was merely a hint of what ought to come. From the start, it drives a wedge between the possessor and reality, subtly and not so subtly changing her perceptions of what something is and what something isn't. It is these strong opinions, only loosely secured by fact or accomplishment, that send us careening towards delusion or worse. Pride and ego say, I am an entrepreneur because I struck out on my own. I am going to win because I'm currently in the lead. I am a writer because I published something. I am rich because I made some money. I am special because I was chosen. I am important because I think I should be. At one time or another, we all indulge this sort of gratifying label making. Yet every culture seems to produce words of caution against it. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. Don't cook the sauce before catching the fish. The way to cook a rabbit is to first catch a rabbit. Game slaughtered by words cannot be skinned. Punching above your weight is how you get injured. Pride goeth before the fall. Let's call that attitude what it is, fraud. If you're doing the work and putting in the time, you won't need to cheat. You won't need to overcompensate. Pride is a masterful encroacher. John D. Rockefeller, as a young man, practiced a nightly conversation with himself. Because you have got to start, he'd say aloud or write in his diary, you think you are quite a merchant. Look out or you will lose your head. Go steady. Early in his career, he'd had some success. He'd gotten a good job. He was saving money. He had a few investments. Considering his father had been a drunken swindler, this was no small feat. Rockefeller was on the right track. Understandably, a sort of self-satisfaction with his accomplishments and trajectory he was heading in began to seep in. In a moment of frustration, he once shouted at a bank officer who refused to lend him money. Someday, he said, I'll be the richest man in the world. Let's count Rockefeller as maybe the only man in the world to say that and then go on to become the richest man in the world. But for every one of him, there are a dozen more delusional assholes who said the exact same thing and genuinely believed it, and then came nowhere close, in part because their pride worked against them and made other people hate them too. All of this was why Rockefeller knew he needed to rein himself in and to privately manage his ego. Night after night he asked himself, are you going to be a fool? Are you going to let this money puff you up, however small it was? Keep your eyes open, he admonished himself. Don't lose your balance. As he later reflected, I had a horror of the danger of arrogance. What a pitiful thing it is when a man lets a little temporary success spoil him, warp his judgment, and he forgets what he is. Why is this? Why can't businesses change and adapt? A large part of it is because they've lost the ability to learn. They stopped being students. The second this happens to you, your knowledge becomes fragile. The great manager and business thinker Peter Drucker says that it's not enough simply to want to learn. As people progress, they must also understand how they learn and then set up processes to facilitate this continual education. Otherwise, we are dooming ourselves to a sort of self-imposed ignorance. Don't tell yourself a story. Myth becomes myth not in the living, but in the retelling. David Marinus. Starting in 1979, football coach and general manager Bill Walsh took the 49ers from being the worst team in football and perhaps all of professional sports to a Super Bowl victory in just three years. It would have been tempting as he hoisted the Lombardi trophy over his head to tell himself that the quickest turnaround in NFL history had been his plan all along. It would have been tempting decades later when he assembled his memoirs to assume that narrative as well. It's a sexy story that his takeover, his turnaround, and the transformation were assiduously scheduled. That it all happened exactly as he wanted, because he was just that good and that talented. No one would have faulted him if he said that. 
yet he refused to indulge in those fantasies. When people asked Walsh whether he had a timetable for winning the Super Bowl, do you know what his answer was? The answer was always no, because when you take over a team that bad, such ambitions would have been utterly delusional. The year before he arrived, the 49ers were 2-14. and 14. The organization was demoralized, broken, without draft picks, and fully ensconced in a culture of losing. His first season, they lost another 14 games. He nearly resigned midway through his second year because he wasn't sure he could do it. Yet 24 months from taking over, and a little over a year from having almost quit, there he was, the Super Bowl champion, genius. How did it happen? How is that not part of the plan? The answer is that when Bill Walsh took control, he wasn't focused on winning per se. Instead, he implemented what he called his standard of performance. That is, what should be done, when, how. At the most basic level, and throughout the organization, Walsh had only one timetable, and it was all about instilling these standards. He focused on seemingly trivial details. Players could not sit down on the practice field. Coaches had to wear a tie and tuck their shirts in. Everyone had to give maximum effort and commitment. Sportsmanship was essential. The locker room must be neat and clean. There would be no smoking, no fighting, no profanity. Quarterbacks were told where and how to hold the ball. Linemen were drilled on 30 separate critical drills. Passing routes were monitored and graded down to the inch. Practices were scheduled to the minute. It would be a mistake to think this was about control. The standard of performance was about instilling excellence. These seemingly simple but exacting standards mattered more than some grand vision or power trip. In his eyes, if the players take care of the details, the score takes care of itself. The winning would happen. Walsh was strong and confident enough to know that these standards would eventually contribute to victory. He was also humble enough to know that when that victory would happen was not something he could predict. That it happened faster than for any coach in history? Well, that was a fortuitous break in the game. It was not because of his grand vision. In fact, in his second season, a coach complained to the owner that Walsh was too caught up in minutia and had no goals to win. Walsh fired that coach for tattling. We want so desperately to believe that those who have great empires set out to build one. Why? so we can indulge in the pleasurable planning of ours, so we can take full credit for the good that happens and the riches and respect that come our way. Narrative is when you look back at an improbable or unlikely path to your success and say, I knew it all along, instead of, I hoped, I worked, I got some good breaks, or even, I thought this could happen. Of course, you didn't really know it all along, or if you did, it was more faith than knowledge. But who wants to remember all the times you doubted yourself? Crafting stories out of past events is a very human impulse. It's also dangerous and untrue. Writing our own narrative leads to arrogance. It turns our life into a story and turns us into caricatures while we still have to live it. As the author Tobias Wolff writes in his novel Old School, these explanations and stories get cobbled together later more or less sincerely, and after the stories have been repeated, they put on the badge of memory and block all other routes of exploration. Bill Walsh understood that it was really the standard of performance, the deceptively small things, that was responsible for the team's transformation and victory. But that's too boring for newspaper headlines. That's why he ignored it when they called him the genius. To accept the title in the story wouldn't have been a harmless personal gratification. These narratives don't change the past, but they do have the power to negatively impact our future. His players shortly proved the risks inherent in letting a story go to their heads. Like most of us, they wanted to believe that their unlikely victory occurred because they were special. In the two seasons after the first Super Bowl, the team failed terribly, partly due to the dangerous confidence that accompanies these kinds of victories, losing 12 of the next 22 games. This is what happens when you prematurely credit yourself with powers you don't yet have control of. This is what happens when you start to think about what your rapid achievements say about you and begin to slacken the effort and standards that initially fueled them. 
Only when the team returned wholeheartedly to the standard of performance did they win again. Three more Super Bowls and nine conference or division championships in a decade. Only when they stopped with the stories and focused on the task at hand did they begin to win like they had before. Here's the other part. Once you win, everyone is gunning for you. It's during your moment at the top that you can afford ego the least, because the stakes are so much higher, the margins for error so much smaller. If anything, your ability to listen, to hear feedback, to improve and grow matter more now than ever before. Facts are better than stories and image. The 20th century financier Bernard Baruch had a great line. Don't try to buy at the bottom and sell at the top. This can't be done except by liars. Thank you.